last time on Through the Bible, we studied Exodus 29, and we heard about the tabernacle's burnt altar that speaks to what Christ did for us on earth. Well, today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us through Exodus 30, and we learn about how the incense altar speaks of what Jesus is doing for us in heaven right now. Welcome aboard the Bible Bus. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through God's entire Word. And you know, I'm so glad that you're here for this exciting study. As Dr. McGee says, Exodus 30 is the great worship chapter. So go ahead, find your seat, get comfortable. And while you do, I want to share a couple letters from listeners of our Spanish broadcast. Viviana writes, Thank you for the notes and outlines. I share them in my local church and also use them for my personal study of the Bible. Thank you for remembering me in your prayers. And then George says, Every morning on my way to work, I listen to you. You are definitely a blessing. May God shower on your lives great blessings for what you give to others. We meet together with six couples and five young people to study with the program, and the notes and outlines have been a great help. And then our final notes from Maria, she shares, I've accepted Christ a couple years ago, and since then I have not been able to attend church. My husband will not let me go. So, you are my church. I feel complete when I listen and I think I'm getting a good education in comparison to what is taught in this area. I miss being with other Christians, but I do feel close to God. Well, our world prayer team is in Central America and the Caribbean this week, and we're praying for listeners of our Spanish broadcast. So if you'd like to join us in lifting up these men and women, these fellow saints, and the wonderful in-country producers and staff who answer letters and phone calls, as well as emails, then visit us at ttb.org forward slash pray and sign up for our world prayer team. You'll be glad you did. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray for the doors of opportunity to open wide for us to bring the teaching of your word to the entire world, especially to those who have no other means to hear it. Would you bless each one of us studying today, and may your word continue to change our hearts and lives as we believe you and obey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We come today, friends, to the 30th chapter of the book of Exodus. We got into the chapter speaking about the altar of incense, but we'd like to come again to it because there's so much we did not deal with before. This altar, you notice the instructions that were given here. It was actually a very small altar. We are told here, a cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. And it was four square. In other words, when we all come to God in prayer, none of us bring anything that makes us to be heard above someone else. We are heard because of Christ. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. It was a small altar but very important. And as we indicated last time, that it was an altar on which no sacrifice was to be made. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meal offering, neither shall ye pour any drink offering thereon. Now the incense that was to be put on it, we'll have to turn to the last of the chapter to find out about it. And I'd like to turn there Verse 34, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto these sweet spices, stactis, anica, galbanum, these sweet spices with pure incense, of each shall there be a like weight. Thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection, after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And anyone was not permitted to offer any other kind than this here. Now the stack, it was a resinous gum that oozed from trees on Mount Gilead. It was called the balm of Jericho. And then the onica came from a species of shellfish, sort of a crab. And the galbanum was taken from the leaves of a Syrian plant. Now the frankincense, no one knows what it was. It was a secret formula, and no one knows what it was. And all of this gave a sweet incense, and it was not to be duplicated. Verse 38, the last verse of the chapter, Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. In other words, if anybody made an 
incense to smell to God than they had smelled. Let me tell you, God wouldn't accept them at all. Now, what does this mean? This altar speaks of prayer, speaks of worship, the place where we offer our praise, our thanksgiving, and our requests. It is not to be duplicated, and the formula was not to be used. In other words, this is an attempt of trying to make worship pleasing to the natural man. And you can't do that. You can't make worship pleasing to the natural man. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so today, all sorts of things are used to try to attract people to church, to get them to come. Nothing should be used but the Word of God. Now, if there's a little ritual with it, fine. But let's make sure the Word of God is the center and everything else centers around the Word of God. Now, that was the incense that was to be offered on it. And we have said that incense speaks of prayer. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense, said David. And it speaks of the fact that our Lord Jesus is our great intercessor in heaven. It's a picture of Christ, our intercessor. It's where Aaron ministered, the high priest. We're told that Aaron shall burn their own sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. It's a place where he ministered. Now, we have here, therefore, a picture of Christ, our great intercessor. And there are two articles in the tabernacle that speak of Christ's work in heaven. One is this altar of incense, and the other is the brazen lava, And we will pick that up in this chapter. I hope we get there today. It's our intention to. Now, there were two altars. We've seen the brazen altar outside. That's where all sacrifice was offered. And then this altar of incense and no sacrifice was to be offered there at all, nor burnt offering. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meal offering. Neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. Now, there were these two altars. The altar of incense is where God deals with a saint. The burnt altar is where God deals with a sinner. And the burnt altar speaks of the earth and the sin of man. The incense altar speaks of heaven and of holiness. The burnt altar is what Christ did for us on earth, and the incense altar is what Christ is doing for us in heaven today. But it also speaks of our prayers. It speaks of our part in worship. And you recall last time I made the statement that we don't actually know where the altar went. After the death of Christ, we find it in the Holy of Holies. That's where it is today. We are told that after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, or the golden altar. That's in Hebrews 9, 3, and 4. And it speaks, therefore, of Christ prays for us. And he's the one who truly praises God and prays for us. He's the one who genuinely worships God for us. He's our intercessor. And how are we to learn to worship? Well, not at the bloody altar. You go as a sinner there, and you take Christ as your Savior. And then you enter the holy place, and there you come to this golden altar, and there's no sacrifice. It's the sin question has to be settled outside. And when you worship God, the sin question has to be settled. And the very basis, though, of our prayers rests upon the fact that this altar once a year is consecrated with blood. And therefore, we are accepted before God, not because of ourselves, but it's because of what and who Christ is, what he did and who he is. We're told that very definitely over in Ephesians 1.6, let me turn and read this, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And the father said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And we're not only to hear him, but we're to pray through him. Christ said we're to pray in his name. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. And that's what it means, I think, praying in the spirit. Now, this article of furniture, you notice, is separated from the other articles of furniture. 
the consecration of priests had to take place before this altar is brought before us. It's an altar of incense. Only priests could worship. Even the king of Zion was smitten with leprosy when he tried to intrude in here. And friends, only priests can pray today. There's a great deal of sentimental rotten rubbish that a person can lead any sort of sinful life, reject Christ, and then in time of trouble, maybe his poor mother's in the hospital, and this old reprobate, he gets down on his knees before God. The moving pictures have shown that. I think sometimes some sentimental preachers talk about these things. God says he'll not answer. Let's be very careful about that, my friend. The altar of incense is where the priests came. The only prayer that any sinner can pray is, God, be merciful to me. And God will hear and answer that when it's brought to him. Now, there's to be continual praise. And you notice God says perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. We're to pray without ceasing. There it was in the morning and in the evening. Now, when the high priest went inside, offered incense, and he spent time in there. You know what happened? That incense got in his garments, and when he came outside, the people, you know, very frankly, they could smell him. You talk about having the right deodorant. He had the right deodorant, and when the great high priest walked by, people just sniffed. They said, my, doesn't he smell good? <laughs> Trouble today with a lot of the saints is they don't have the right deodorant. The right deodorant is prayer. Let my prayer send before thee a sweet incense. And it'll get in your garments when you spend time in prayer. Now we pass to the second requirement of worship. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I'm reading now verse 12, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. There be no plague among them because they are to be redeemed. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty gyras, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. And it was of silver, you see. They shall be ransom of silver. And silver is the medal of redemption. It's a type of redemption. Everyone had to be redeemed that could worship. Now, we hear a great deal today about public worship. Actually, there's no such thing. Only the redeemed can worship. And we ought to be very careful about that. I can well understand that a great many people going over the band of radio would come to this program, and if a man is a Christian, I think he'd be alerted and probably listen. If he's not a Christian, he says, oh, my gracious, here's another one of those Bible screamers. I won't listen to him. And then he passes over it. Or he may start listening, and if he does, he'll get redeemed. That's the thing we count on. We found out that God will speak to many hearts if they'll listen to the Word of God. Now, when they're redeemed, we can worship God. Then we can meet around the Word of God, but you have to be redeemed. And very frankly, we're not as careful even on this program as we should be. I ask people to support it. But I hope you understand I'm talking to believers. Now, if you're an unbeliever, we're not asking you to give a thing to the program because actually we don't think you can worship God. And giving is an act of worship. And therefore, we trust you'll listen. You're welcome to listen and even to send for the notes and outlines. We'd love for you to have them. And we believe if you will, you'll become redeemed, that you will turn to the Lord and be saved. That's the wonder of the wonders of studying the Word of God, friends. Now, not only must they be redeemed, but they must be cleansed. That brings us to the lava. And the lava now is in the outer court, was made of brass. And there are two articles out there, the brazen altar. That's where God settles the sin question. That's where he deals with our sin as sinners. And the lava, brazen lava is out there. And that's where God deals with our sins as saints. Because after all, the saints sin. I've been with them a long time, friends. This idea today that the saints are heavenly, they're not that yet. To dwell above with saints in love, that'll be glory. 
but to stay below with the saints, I know that's another story, friends. Now let's look here, and I'm reading verse 17 of chapter 30 of Exodus. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a lave of brass, and his foot also of brass. Now the foot is a little basin below that they wash their feet in. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burnt offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now the priests could not serve unless the first thing they did when they came in the tabernacle, they'd go wash. They got contaminated, you see, on the outside. And every time you go to church, friends, on Sunday, maybe after all, it isn't the fact that the preacher's dull. It may be that you're dirty. And when you have a combination though, of a dull preacher and a dirty saint, you don't have very exciting service. I can tell you that. But the thing we need to do is to remember that you can't worship until you've been cleansed. You and I get dirty in this world. It's the reason the Lord washed the disciples' feet. He's still doing that today, by the way. We need to go to the laver, and that is the first thing they did. Now, if they go into the burnt altar with the sacrifice, they wash before, and afterward they wash. If they go into the holy place, they wash when they go in, they wash when they come out. And I'm of the opinion that that matter of washing was pretty important, so important that I think maybe one priest that came up and washed his hands had turned to the other priest that's there washing his, and he says, my, says, how many times you been up here today? And that fellow says, I've been up here half a dozen times. The other one says, well, I've been up here nearly a dozen times. And look at my hands. I've got dishpan hands. I've washed so much. And I wonder why God wants us to do this. And I suppose Aaron standing in the background would say, well, look here, brethren. I'll tell you why the Lord wants you to wash. He wants you to know you've got to be holy. And you can't worship him. And you can't serve him unless you've been cleaned up. This idea today that any dirty saint living in sin, every now and then you hear of some man that gets involved, sometimes a preacher with a woman or some Christian worker with a woman, and they say, my, I don't understand it. He seemed to be such a wonderful servant of God. My friend, if you check his work, you'll find out it is wood, hay, and stubble. God sees to it that it doesn't amount to anything, and there's nothing like that that will make a phony and bring the work of God today into disrepute. Now, this brazen laver, this was the place where the priests wash. We are to come to him today in confession. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's very important to see this laver of brass. It has to do with our sanctification. That's in my book on the tabernacle. That's the thing that I emphasize. It speaks of the sanctification of the believer. And you and I are to go and wash if we're going to serve God. And we go there to wash if we're going to be used of God. It's very important that we be clean. Now, again, we need to not only have the sweet incense in our garments, but we ought to have our bodies washed with pure water. <laughs> The pure water is the Word of God. You know what the label was made out? Made out of brass. It was made out of the mirrors of the women, that we are told. They brought their mirrors, and they used brass in that day, highly polished brass for mirrors. They didn't have a glass like we have today. And, of course, women haven't changed, and men haven't either, down through the centuries, so the women all had mirrors, and they brought those. Now, what is it that reveals the sin? It's the Word of God. The Word of God is a mirror, and we're to look into the mirror, the Word of God, and we see that there's a smudge spot on us. What are we to do? And he's washing feet today. The laver also is in heaven, and you go to him if we confess our sins. Now, you don't go to confess publicly. You go to him. That laver's in heaven, and you go to him. And I think every Sunday before you ever go to church, you ought to go in and confess your sins of the week. Now, don't tell me you don't get dirty. I know you do. I get dirty. Your eyes get dirty. Your mind gets dirty. Your hands get dirty. Your feet get dirty. You get dirty. 
and the trouble in our churches today, in our fundamental churches on Sunday morning, and I'm not being crude when I say this. And one of the reasons that people are not interested in coming there is simply because there's too much spiritual B.O. We need to go to him in confession today. We need to go to that laver and wash today before we go into worship. And God doesn't accept worship until it comes from a cleansed heart, nor will he accept service. That is something that's certainly being proven out now. Not only should we be washed, and not only should we have the incense, but we also should be anointed. Verse 22, Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and so on. Verse 25, Thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and the vessels. And verse 30, Thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now that is something that you and I need today. What is that anointing? John says in his epistle, we have an anointing. What is that anointing? Well, that anointing is the Holy Spirit. And we have an anointing that enables us to understand the Word of God. And that's the reason that the Word of God is being made real to so many people today, even by radio. Friends, it's not the speaker. It's not the program. It is the Word of God used by the Spirit of God. And only the Spirit of God can anoint you. You don't go to some man and have him pour oil on you. Go to God, even right now, and say, Oh God, open my heart and open my mind and my life to understand your word. Give me an anointing. And that anointing is very important today. It is all important. In fact, John mentions that probably I should not take it for granted that you're going to look it up. Probably I should turn to it and read it. This is 1 John 2.20. We have an unction, and that word unction is anointing. We have an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And then we're told down in verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him." Now, friends, the Holy Spirit is the one that can open your mind and heart when you go to worship God, to understand, to bring blessing to your heart, to give you a real thrill. Oh, there are so many people asking the question, what's life all about? What shall I do? How shall I communicate? Oh, my friend today, ask God to let the Spirit of God make real to you the Word of God. So until next time, may God bless you richly, my beloved. Isn't it fascinating to see how the tabernacle still speaks to us? To share these messages with a friend or maybe deepen your study by listening again, you can always do that by visiting ttb.org or better yet, why don't you download our new app? I'm super excited about it because I know that you're going to love it just as much as I do. You know, one of the best new features is that the Bible is actually embedded right in the app, so you can read the passage along with listening to Dr. McGee. And then it also lets you listen to any book on demand and then saves your progress, and you can pick up where you left off. It's really a handy tool. Your study with Dr. McGee has never been so easy or so customizable. So be among the first to check it out. You can download it today from your app store. And speaking of Bible study resources, do you have Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for the book of Mark? Well, our study of Exodus ends next week as the Bible bus rolls right along into the New Testament book of Mark. So if you want to download your free copy of the notes and outlines that include the book of Mark, visit ttb.org and look for our digital book, Briefing the Bible. And remember, you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll send you an abridged paperback copy in the mail for free. You can't beat it. You can also write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. 
What will it take for your church prayer meeting to be the most exciting meeting of the week? Well, join us tomorrow as Dr. McGee takes us to Exodus 31 and 32 for the answer. Until then, I'm Steve Schwetz praying that God blesses you as you believe his word today. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Our story on the Bible bus today is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too?